Um, and then there's been other significant things that, have, um, that Mass Hall has uh, done over the years. I think a couple of them are that it was Massachusetts Hall of Cultural Society members uh, who developed the Concord Grape. Uh, that was a very significant new, um, new product. Um, the awards, the honorary awards of the society are the longest established and, and I would say the most prestigious awards uh, program in the United States for horticulture. Um, we actually are awarding those next week. We have a very fancy dinner next Thursday. Um, we'll be honoring um, Robert Bartlett, who owns Bartlett Trees, as well as um, the, the people behind the American Beauties. Are people familiar with American Beauties brand? So they were really the first people to commercialize and bring into the national um, garden center space um, native plants as something you should be doing in your garden about 20, 25 years ago. So they really were ahead of, ahead of the game on that. So we'll be recognizing the, the two co-owners behind that and also um, a professor from um, North Carolina, um, NC State, um, Tom Rainey, who's really one of the leading breeders, as well as a lot of our um, key volunteers. We have volunteers who've been supporting us for 20, 30, 40, and even 50 years. And so we'll be recognizing some of them, particularly connected to our library. Uh, although we have um, re we had to reduce the size of the library, we do still have a valuable and uh, um, rare, uh, rare books library. Um, we don't keep it on site, it's actually um, in storage. Um, and so we're recognizing a lot of the work that, that they've done. So let me just talk a little bit about the garden. This is a much more recent thing. Um, we have been on this site since 1996 um, and really developing it since more like 2000. And it is the historic um, garden and grounds of most recently the Cheney um, Boltzall Mansion, which we'll see later. It's a 36,000 square foot um, Gilded Age mansion that's currently derelict. Um, it was has been derelict since before we were on site, since the 1980s. Um, and uh, if anyone knows anyone who got 30 million to spare, and we would be very happy to redevelop it, but that's the kind of numbers we're, we're talking about. Um, but do let me know if you know someone who wants to restore a Gilded Age mansion. So this obviously had an original layout. Um, you'll see there's formal gardens in front of the manor house, they're original in terms of design. Um, there's a more informal landscape down to one side that's currently about to be renovated, and we'll talk about that when we get there. And then actually a lot of the the garden would have then fo faced that way into what are now the soccer fields. And so there would have been formal gardens as an English woods um, over there. And then the remainder of the reservation, really, which is to this side, is we've got 36 acres here. There's about another 10 acres of soccer fields and other things here. And then there's another 140 acres that's part of the DCR reservation. And that would have been carriage trails. That would have been really part of the garden. They'd have cut trails through that and that would have been for walking and for um, just, just spending time in. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, an All-American Selection Trial Garden. So we receive um, uh, new genetic material um, the, from breeders, from people like Ball and St. Gentry and the big companies. Um, we don't know what it is. It's pre-market release. It's just codenamed. It's not actually got names yet, not been released to the public. And generally what happens, um, really simply, is that we get the best modern cultivars that are available that are already on the market, and we get the new cultivars that they're developing and then we grow them side by side and we assess them through the year. And so everything in here, this is, this is one of the larger um, sort of uh, programs. We actually do all of them. We do all of them. So there are different trials. There's um, perennials, there's, um, there's annuals from seed, there's cuttings, there's edibles. Um, and so we grow these out, we assess them, um, we send our results in, and, the resu and as a result of that, the, the breeders decide whether to release or not release. Um, and it's a nice garden feature um, for us. And we don't know yet the results uh, from this year's trials. Um, it, it's a very complex, once, once the data leaves us, it becomes quite a complicated process. We don't really know how that works. Um, but this is, this is quite a favorite, and um, one of the things we, we haven't done this year just for logistical reasons, but we, we will do is, um, we, it's really good to do um, something that's not connected to the trial, which is also to get the visiting public to just vote for what they like. Um, it's always a bit interactive, a bit fun to see. It's sometimes surprising that, that it's not what you think it would be. So you'll, Janice, you'll be interested, baby. You see that's a very upright plant there with a big balloon. I thought those okay. were like pears or something. It's or a apple. physalis. Is it prickly? You can touch no. it? I have pretty bad allergies. I probably shouldn't touch it. No, it's got little hairs. Well, that's not. I thought it was like a, it looked like a dwarf apple tree. Yeah, far. I was like, oh, I was like, I was why are there so many apples over there? Or pears or Feels something. Feels like a weird like sea creature or something. Sea creature, Emma, what are you it talking does, about? It does, like a, a balloon. sea anemone or something. So one of the other, one of the interesting things, uh, I'll just mention this because this is a, a thing that people don't really think about, and then we must move on, 
if you have a look at uh, a lot of the, even just the, the foliage that's left, look how standardized the height and shape and of all of these plants is, um, pretty much. And a lot of breeding um, that happens in the ornamental market actually happens for ease of production as much as it does for being ornamentally as good. So the reason that you can see there's a salvia there with a mixed um, white and sort of lavender yeah. kind of color, look how uniform that is and look what that height is. Some of these are being bred specifically to get a certain number of trays on a nursery trolley, oh. right? And so you get perfect uniform height because that's an efficient production system. So it's sometimes interesting. Sometimes we don't know why these are being selected the way they are, but it could be for disease resistance. It could be um, just for production, um, for production reasons. So a real variety in, in reasons why people are, are selecting your cold of us. Do you guys take drives on like So this is, this is one of our, our core and really important gardens. This is the Wheezy's Garden for Children and it was um, funded and um, sponsored by the, the Wheezy's Foundation. Um, it's one of the largest and one of the earlier established um, children's gardens in the, in the northeast of the United States. One of the really nice things about this is so you look at the trees and you look at the planting, it's really reaching uh, maturity in terms of what the design intent was. In fact, so much so there's a few things we're going to have to swap out. It was very much designed to be interactive. Um, you see that there's the, the sand, um, the water, the sound. Um, we've shut them down for the season, but across the other side, there's the mist jets. Um, and, you know, it's designed to be interactive. On this side, we have a pollinator garden, and there's these much smaller paths cutting through it that really are only children sized. You wouldn't want to go around right them yourself. Um, they're in the shape of a butterfly, um, so this was designed um, as a pollinator garden for that. We have some outdoor teaching space, we have a lot of bird boxes, um, Frogs. there's a lot of small areas, yeah, there's fr yeah. I, in fact, I'll show you that because um, I'll, I'll tell you about this exhibit we did. But this is, this is you know, hugely popular, this really drives a lot of visitation, a lot of families here, uh, and still, still one of the best designed and most varied um, children's gardens I've ever seen. I've been very fortunate to see a lot of gardens, a um, lot of change in elevation, a lot of um, areas where you sort of can run up and down. And uh, so this is pretty good. But what we really wanted this to be, and what the designer really wanted this to be, was a garden first, um, not a play area. So it's it's much, it's very heavily landscaped. It's very plants first. It's very, you know, we've tried to put interesting and varied plants in. It's not a playground dressed up with some plants. It's a garden with, uh -huh. with tactile central elements. Um, that's, that's the idea. So I'll just walk you through. It's kind of narrow, so we'll just walk through and then I'll, I'll pause this to the other side. So this has got a bit wild. The, obviously, so our last, we close um, Sunday. Sunday's our last day for the season. We reopen the Festival of Trees for a month um, in December. And then um, we come back to the 1st of April. Freddie here. So all of these have names. So we we had an exhibit of um, 15 of these through the garden this summer. Um, it's a it's an exhibit. It's called Rivet the Exhibit. And um, each of these is a little gardening character. Um, obviously Freddie is out with his butterfly net. That's kind of frowned on these days, but um, <laughs> he's out with his butterfly net uh, in the butterfly garden. And so after the exhibit finished at the end of September, we were able to keep him. And there's another one called Cora, we might just see on the way past as well. But you know, people love this. Sometimes you just need to give people an extra reason to visit a garden um, over and above, you know, something that's there and then going away. So that's what exhibits like this just do. We've got a renovation program in here at the moment. So um, we're really investing in the, mainly the hidden infrastructure. Um, this is now coming up 20 years old. So um, we're just starting to fix a lot of things. Done. We're gonna do a we're gonna do a, a project to restore and yeah beautiful seating there. We'll restore um, a lot of bird boxes over the winter with a couple of volunteer and school projects to get that happen. things 
about this as a children's garden, we didn't want it just to be a play space. So you got a lot of seating places, places where um, we can really have this multi-generational interaction. One, one of the things we don't want to do is take children, separate them from their families and say, this is your thing, and then everyone else, you're over here. So this does work really well at um, keeping families together, keeping people together. Um, yeah, there's lots of little pieces. There's several hidden ones of these different locations. There's a couple that you walk past on the entrance. So we just try to um, keep those little artistic elements. How's a wooden pool room at that? Oh, maybe. What uh, Yes, in fact, <laughs> absolutely. That is uh, that's actually new as well. There must be bugs in there. Pretty recent. Yes. This is petrified. This petrified wood. Um, petrified stumps. So they they are absolutely rock hard. Um, but they are stunning. It was one of the original features. We struggle a little with this area, just maintenance-wise, keeping it working and, and other things. But um, no, this is stunning. You, you see the, the plant choices as well. They're intended to be sort of Jurassic. So these are the very early, um, early plant. Now looking at as the form and structure and the oh, repetition yeah, and shape, right? Might have so, it right the pool too, one, one of the signs of a really well designed garden is you, you keep the structure and shape and the pattern without having the flower. Right, right. Um, that's, that's, so it looks good. Yeah. So this is a relatively small see. space, but when we were we were just I don't know 20 yards away across there, looking at the petrified wood, and then with, between the two we've got this table and sort of social space, and then. This is a chime, these are chime bars, um, so the musical element, and then this is sort of just a little labyrinth in the grass. So all these little, packing these little features in so that there's a lot of things going on is, is one of the secrets to getting a, a garden like this working for families, for children. So this garden, so these gardens were all sort of put in in, in succession really down this side um, when the garden was being developed from about 2000 through 2005, 6, 7. So this, this here that we're going to look into and walk through, this is the, um, the Bresselium Garden. This is um, designed by Adrian Bloom, who has a, a very famous nursery, nursery called Blooms of Bressingham in the UK. Um, and he was um, commissioned to design this, and it was actually all planted in one day, um, a massive volunteer crew. We have no designs, we have no plans, because what he did was all the plants were ordered, and then he just walked around and laid them out and said, just plant them there. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. And which is kind of fun, but it's really unhelpful right now because obviously the more competitive plants have got really competitive and outgrown everything else. And there's a few gaps and we really want to go back and, and edit it, but we don't really know where we started. Um, but again, this is a really nice garden in that it's got that combination. It's got um, the perennials and the trees. Um, it's got a lot of variety in form and shape. He, he really pioneered um, having island beds. So pre-Bloom's design work, mainly what you would do in your garden is you would put stuff in front of your house and then round the edges of your borderline, right? And then you have lawn in the middle. And in the 50s and 60s, Bloom, Bloom, Adrian Bloom and his family really pioneered this idea of actually you don't have to have a big lawn in the middle. You can actually have flower beds in the middle as well. Uh, and that really started with him and, and became a sort of came over here. So he's still very well known in this country. Um, so we're going to walk through this um, again. Most of the floor, most of the perennials have flowered and finished. We tend to leave things um, up until late winter, early spring. Um, we only really cut things down when we have to for practical reasons. But otherwise, we'll just leave this sort of fairly rough over the winter. It's good for good for birds. Good for getting nutrient back into the soil. Um, it makes for a really really busy spring. But if we can, we try to leave it. So we'll just walk through here and. Um, Have a 
try to control that. Staying invisible. Yeah. Staying invisible. There's a lot of people. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot going on here. I think um, grasses are very much in vogue. Probably 10, 15 years. Particularly work of Pete Odor, Odorf, These sort of big prairie and meadow type plantings that came out of a lot of work that happened really in Germany in the 70s and 80s. Um, but again, that was that that really has gone in the direction of all perennials, like large scale perennials and, and everything else. Um, Adrian and, and, and what the work he was doing in the UK was really the first to say, okay, you can have a you can have a mixed border, sort of the wild garden, the William Robinson type thing, which was you know perennials, geophytes, and um, trees and shrubs. That was really much the woodland edge model. Um, and they were the, some of the first to come along and say, hey, let's have some grasses too, see what it looks like. Um, so this is perhaps a look that you don't see all that much. With you know, you've got some woody plants, you've got some geophytes, you've got some gra big grasses, you've got some evergreens, you've got some decisions. There's really everything in here. Um, and so the, the structural, <laughs> it is, but it's also, it has enough repetition and structure and they've sort of played with the bed shape enough that, um, that it works. It's not sort of just everything everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and they managed to frame up the, the house quite well. Oh, that's nice. It's it is really really fast fast. I like the way it goes up tall, but then it dips down, which isn't yeah. typical too. It's not like then yeah, and you'll see it builds up to the trees. It's exactly. So what, what year was this planted? This was planted in 2000 and I think four. So something like, like those trees were? Yeah, so they went in fairly small. Um, and not teeny tiny, but you know, often getting trees in, I know everyone wants instant and I don't want to <laughs> hurt anyone's business by decrying that because I know that's, that's important to people, but Often you get stuff in small, it'll get away a lot quicker. Um, and when you're, you know, when you're operating the way we do, which is not spending a huge amount, then just get them in small and get them going. Like yeah. So what we're going to do, what we'll do now is we will go through and we will have a clear through really just to hoe off anything that's already germinated um, sort of between now and when it gets really cold okay. and the idea is that we'll just hold it over the winter okay. and then we won't really touch it again until it warms up um, we have variously we were operating until a couple of years ago on a sort of heavy mulch system um, which we've stopped doing we want really to cover the soil with plants and not with mulch um, and where we do mulch now, we've switched to arborist wood chips, so we're getting that breathability and that sort of slow decay, um, rather than sort of getting a mat of, you know, partially composted bark mulch. We don't really don't really use that. Um, we don't really have a comp composting system yet. We actually have a grant application in currently, um, just to try and get that up and running um, properly. So that that starts to change, you know, how much we're returning to the soil. But no, we we we'll. We'll focus now. We're really focused on you know the woody plant pruning just to keep it, you know, because it's a good time to do it, and also for snow, uh, bear, you know, bearing snow over the winter. We don't want things breaking. And um, we are incredibly low staffed, so um, we we were actually in some ways fortunate. So I came in in January last year, and there were two horticultural positions that were being held uh, open for me to fill. Uh, we've since we also then. Um, had two other positions that were temporarily available senior positions and so as the pandemic hit we were hiring four key positions um, and it actually worked out really well because we needed to cut our costs dramatically so we just held them open for a year so last year we were operating this garden on one and a half horticulturists um, everything you're seeing plus me and my wife at the weekends basically um, we did a lot of hours well thank you um, everyone, gets, everyone <laughs> well, I, gets their hands dirty so, yeah and I did 10 years as a, on the job on the tools so uh, yeah it was sort of fun <laughs> yeah, it wasn't fun actually that's a lie it wasn't fun does anything need to get wrapped for like is any, can everything stay in the winter or do any um, big trees or anything we have been leaving everything but I, we, there'll be a bit this year that we do actually change that up a bit because we, we've taken a bit of damage um, so uh, so we just went very low staffed and then this year when we actually had 
the resource. We've had a fantastic year. We've had really, really great response from our donors, huge support from a lot of new programs we're starting. And we actually can afford to hire and now we can't hire anyone because there's just no one to hire. So, if, and you're finding, I know you're doing some really innovative marketing to hire people. We've hired quite a few. You hired well. So we have struggled. I don't know if I want to tell you any tips, but I <laughs> Well, I know what you're doing. I yeah, see what you're doing. Yeah, you and, know, um, you yeah, and you've got a great it's approach. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we're in Wellesley. It's, this is a very high cost of living place to be and getting people to come and, and take some of those horticulture jobs is, is tough. So we're going to do a big push over the, um, over the <clears> winter <throat> um, and, and really try to actually move probably end up moving people in. So one of the interesting things about this area, there's a fantastic, vibrant commercial horticulture world, it seems, mm -hmm. but there's a very, very small public horticulture world. There really aren't the big public gardens that there are somewhere like mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Um, and so there's not that depth. It's a very different approach. What we do is not what you would do in a commercial horticulture setting. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a gap in the, or the, a difference in those skills. Um, so we really are looking for someone who's got 10, 15 years in a big ornamental public garden um, and we might well end up needing to bring them in to do that. So I just want to keep us moving. Um, up the top there we're not going to go up because it's really over and it's not been the highlight this year at all. Um, this is our seed to table productive garden. Um, it's fantastic to have, we'll keep having it but we are actually moving the focus of our um, edibles into schools and we really want to be doing a lot more in schools, a lot more in Greater Boston. Um, really want to be focusing on food, food insecurity, places where people don't have access to fresh food and how we can tap into the interest that there is in um, using technology in horticulture particularly. And so there's a, there's a big program that we're working on developing at the moment for next year. So we'll always have that, um, but we don't really want to be busing students into site. We really want to be going to students um, a lot more than we have been. I was going to ask that. Do they come here on field trips on a regular basis? There's a lot of like Pre the past too, two right? years, yes. Yeah. Not so much the past two years. And then similarly with going into schools, we had a pretty big schools program that we just stopped. Um, and we're not back to that yet. So we are taking this time to, to really scale up. Just pointing out the manor house, that's really, you know, you, it's hard to understand a garden like this um, without understanding that that's the centerpiece and that's where everything builds from. So there really would have been two key axes, one down the middle, which we're about to go into, and another one here um, through the soccer fields. This really would have been the front, um, the front here. Do you own this land? Does no, so all of this is, this whole area is 186 acres. It's all really tightly in the crook of the river, the Charles River. So there's river, um, around every side, it starts in that corner, it does a loop, it goes further out that way, comes all the way around this site really tightly to the bridge that you came in on, really tightly all the way up there and then carries on there. So the only, the only land edge we have is basically this tree line here and that's a full row of houses behind that. Um, so the bridge you came over really makes us pretty much an island. Um, so the whole property is Department of Conservation and Recreation. Um, we have 36 acres here. There's about 10 there, and the rest is trails and, and woodland. So what we're going to do is we're going to head into um, the Italianate, which is the, the formal garden. We're going to go a little bit down this way um, to see it, and um, just have a look at this astonishing hedge as well as you go, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The restoration cost of that, that's 40,000 square feet. Um, the restoration cost of that is somewhere in the region 25 to 30 million. Um, and so if someone had 25 to 30 million that they wanted to help us out with, yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. But we're a horticultural society first, not a historic buildings organization. Um, over the past, before us even, over the past 30, 40, 50 years, there's been various approaches to people who are historic building societies. And the general consensus is it's a beautiful building, it's a potentially important building, but there are others that, that are higher up the list than this one and therefore the chances of this one ever getting done are very low. Now, the biggest problem is just the scale. So the, the per foot cost of doing that is only about five, six hundred dollars a square foot. Well, we're in Wellesley where the average residential property price is thousand, twelve hundred square foot. So it's not, it's not a completely economically unviable thing to do, it's just how do you raise 25 or 30 million to do it? Because you can't, you can't restore 10% of a house, you know, and then do another 10% later, you have to do it. So we've, we've had various um, discussions, even in the past couple of years, we, we were talking with another nonprofit, that is not gonna happen. Um, the real, there are two challenges really. Um, well, there's already only one. 
the challenge is, is that to get it done, it has to earn an income of some kind to pay for the capital. And the only real way for it to earn an income is to build significant additional buildings that also are attached to it. So yeah, you could be talking a hotel, you could be talking about a conference center, you could be talking about a cultural center, an arts place. But effectively, you have to see that, if you, if you go down that route, you have to see that as the, the front of house, and then you have to add sort of a 50 million or 100 million dollar project on top of it. Um, and then you're sort of talking. And that's why I brought yeah. the bank. So, yeah. So <laughs> it's not, it's, it's an interesting one. And I, I think it's, it's on the, t you know, it, it, is, it is something that is discussed for us. Um, I don't think, <laughs> I need to be careful. Um, I don't think it's as impossible as my predecessors have thought it is. But I think you need to take a 10, 20 year timeline on it, not a, what are we going to do in the next three years? Um, so we'll certainly look at that. And one of the things we are going to do, um, we're currently getting costing, so it's, it's watertight, but the big challenge we have is that the windows are really degraded um, and the woodwork and that. So just getting that, those windows painted would probably buy us another five to eight years, not even doing the woodwork, just painting it. Um, that's a six, uh, you know, well into six figures job, but we will probably um, have a fundraising push in the next year to try and do that. Um, well, we're in, it's, we haven't necessarily built those relationships historically that we should have done. So we'll work on that. Wouldn't it make sense to turn it into a dispensary? <laughs> <laughs> that is not the first time that that has been proposed. <laughs> you have the money tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a perfect spot. Yep. You do all your A-B testing all day. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that is um, <laughs> that has come up. Um, interesting to say. So we're going to just go down here because I want to take you through the middle. Um, we got into that conversation quick. <laughs> oh yeah. This is, this is the formal Italianate style garden. Originally this would have just been grass and evergreens. It wouldn't have had any of the planting in it. It would have been very sparse. Um, we've got a beautiful um, purple beech hedge, um, which um, Bartlett's have actually been doing a huge amount of work for us. It was really spread too wide and, and need a lot of restoration work. And um, they had a team come and resolve that for us, which was really good of them. I believe they're coming back in two weeks time to re-trim re it for us this year. Um, so we have a lot of weddings in here, a lot of wedding ceremonies. We have about 50, 60 weddings a year and they use this space um, and then finish up where we're going to be. Um, the fountain is a 17th century Spanish baptismal font um, that was repurposed and was brought over when they were doing the house, as we understand it. Um, inside the house, actually, so they had the house built while they were on honeymoon. They, they, they did the sort of old European thing, which you go on the grand tour of Europe while you're having your, you know, for your honeymoon for six months. And so every major city they went to, you know, Verona and Rome and all around Italy, they commissioned uh, a separate marble fireplace for each, each city and got them shipped back. So every room has a different marble fireplace from a different city around Europe. Um, so it is still in reasonably good shape. Um, it's just we're not allowed in it because of um, health and safety rules. Um, and and the, the cost of doing that is high, very high. So we're gonna we're gonna head down. We're actually running a bit later than I thought we would. So we're gonna head down. I'm gonna show you uh, the major focus of our work in the next couple of years, and then we'll head back. Yeah. 
satisfaction, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this, this is actually perhaps what the most important area on the property in a lot of ways from just a historic point of view. Um, it's also one that has been derelict since the 1950s. So um, this whole area, you can see the house at the top of the hill there. And then this whole area sort of sweeping down from the house, this low point, and then all the way along the garden to this, the interior bridge that you'll cross when you leave. Not the one you came in on, there's a second bridge on site. This was a landscape that was designed by the Olmsted brothers um, in 1916. It wasn't really installed fully until 1926. Um, and it was a really quite important garden. In fact, in 1930, I'm gonna get the date wrong, 37 or 39, um, Massachusetts Horticultural Society awarded its Gold Garden Medal, um, which was considered the most prestigious award you could receive um, at the time anywhere in the United States. Um, we don't have much record of it in terms of photos because um, the Cheneys were um, very private. As they wouldn't allow any photos of the garden um, and they, until they received that award. And what the condition of that reward was that they, that award was that they would do an article, um, there would be an article in um, one of the national magazines. And so there was one article with photos showing this garden when it was at its prime. But we do have, um, we do have the nursery list from a large area of the planting. We do have original plans for this. So this was originally built as an Asian garden um, and sometimes called the temple garden. So the temple piece is this, which is now falling down. This actually in the bottom was actually the winter store so there's actually a heating pipe that runs from the manor house to here. And this is where all of the corms and the tubers and things that they overwintered, they would have gone in here. And then on the top, there was a patio. There was a, um, a, a steel temple type structure and that was where they'd sit and enjoy the view. And then down here, all the way through where this is overgrown, right the way around the back to the tree line, this would have been what they called the Asian garden. It would have had the classic kidney shaped sort of double pond. Um, with the Japanese style bridge in the middle which you can just see is derelict and then you can't see um, but through here um, just between this pond and about 20 foot there there was a canal that was dug all the way from the Charles River so the Charles River is about 600 700 feet away and they dug a man-made canal um, and put their boat houses on it because if you live there you don't want to a you want a beautiful garden feature in the wetland but also you don't want your boathouse to be too far away. So you bring the river to your house. Um, and so there were two boathouses and various other things. There's some really interesting quirks about this landscape. Um, the stone, is there any flags? There's these flags here, there's a few that we've lifted uh, just under the Pakistandra. There was a flag path that went all the way down the side here, which we can't find, but it also does a full loop around the ponds and to the canal, which, which is still there. This was actually reclaimed material from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And when they took up the flooring and redid it in about 1906, the um, Olmsted brothers bought the whole lot and brought it here for this job. So one of the fun little things is that, best we can tell, the flagstones here that are a part of our garden path um, are the flagstones that Washington was inaugurated on in his second inauguration. Not the first one, because the first one was in New York. The capital was still in New York but the second one was in Philadelphia and these are the reclaimed flagstones. So weird little historical things and there's, there's records on that as well. So the, the exciting thing about this is that um, we're in wetlands so there's incredibly strict rules about what we're allowed to do here. As you can see it's completely blanketed in non-native invasive species. Um, on Wednesday night after a nine month and very expensive process um, we got permission from Dover Conservation Commission to start um, invasive weed removal in here. So this winter and next spring we'll work sort of from here down, we'll clear all this out, we'll get, we'll just put in a holding mix, a seed mix that just holds it um, and so we, you know, this is now a redevelopment project um, for this, this garden. So we're doing something very specific and very deliberate. We are not going to be trying to raise millions of dollars getting a landscape designer in to design the whole landscape and then build it. That's not what Massachusetts Horticultural Society is about anymore. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to bring this back to use through our education and our volunteering programs. So the idea is we'll try to host our education programs here and combine education and actually gardening, actually working in, in the landscape. 
We're very interested in horticultural therapy programs, ways that we can um, start to look at rehabilitation, maybe transition to work programs. And there's a lot of work in here. So rather than go out, take a mechanical build approach, we're gonna take a, you know, take five to eight years and actually garden this back to what it was rather than build it back to what it was. Now there'll still be need to be built elements. Obviously we wanna restore things like this, we wanna restore the boathouse. Um, there's gonna be, you know, we need to talk about wetland. Um, but this is just a very much a, a first step. And so we, we have a, a donor who has underwritten um, basically two years of salary to have a position, a conservation horticulturist, who really just lead this whole project. Um, so that, that kicks off um, in the next couple of weeks. So your wife and yourself are not doing this? I am not going to be getting involved in this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be a slow process. We're not got, you know, we're, we're still at the, you know, it's a non-herbicide program. It's a non-mechanical program at this point, although that will probably change. Um, but we really want it to be a, you know, set a standard for um, teaching and for involving volunteers and, and members in the program. So you can just see some tail lights of a vehicle sort of in the distance. That is the end, that's our boundary, and that's about a hundred yards beyond that is the Charles River. Okay. So this canal that goes through here, that goes all the way through. And you can see it's got this hedger of 120 of Suga canadensis that also is um, of Western Hemlock. Um, it's not right, Western Hemlock. Um, that is full of woolly adelgia. It's a lot of stand, 30% standing deadwood. So actually part of this program is that they'll come out um, and we'll just open up this landscape all the way through. That was really only planted as a hedgerow. Um, what is that? Is that the original sheep shed? There's three of them on the side. No, this is... No, it's the original sheep shed. This is the other frog um, with the cat. So this was a fantastic program. Um, And then, like everything we do, the, the QR code went to a website with more educational information, did a lot on um, frog ecology, how the landscape impacts them, and um, the whole sort of integrated piece. It's 5 o'clock, I better get back or I'll be in trouble with Chuck. <laughs> yeah. So what, we're, what you're seeing, we're passing the, the herb garden. We manage in partnership with the Rhododendron Society. This area we just passed is in partnership with Noana Garden Club. Um, so we've got quite a lot of other organisations that, that work with us. We'll just cut straight across the lawn. We do encourage walking on the lawn. Better lose. Stand on your pedestal. I will. I don't know what that is. It's freezing. Really yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to... I'm just going to give you a last bit of information and then I'll let you go back and see Chuck because Chuck will tell me off. I'm already a little bit late. <laughs> so I paused here because um, these are really interesting. So these three here are the, the horticultural goddesses. And these were um, on the roof line, the apex of the second horticultural hall in downtown Boston. So Massachusetts Horticultural Society had three horticultural halls. This was the second. The third is still there. Um, that's the huge building that says Massachusetts Horticultural Society on it, opposite the Symphony Hall. And um, these were missing, presumed, um, disappeared. And they were actually found um, up on a private estate um, in, on the North Shore. Uh, it, was a, it was actually a private school estate on the North Shore um, when the garden was being, um, being restored. And so they were brought back, they were put in the garden, restored, and, and they've been there ever since. 
but I think it's just a nice piece um, to remind us of our history. Um, we're, we're, we are the oldest established horticultural society in the US. And our founding mission, which really we stayed true to um, for most of our uh, legacy, um, was for the public good. Um, that was always the founding, founding motto. And one of the things that's happening at the moment is that Massachusetts Horticultural Society is changing. And I think we're changing to really refocus back on that. I think for probably a number of years, maybe decades, um, we've really been a society of um, people who really, really love plants and are really great at plants. And you know, perhaps exemplified by the flower show and, and some of the higher end classes we do. And, and you know, for want of a better expression, the ladies at the lunch crowd. Do we say that in this country? Mm. Or is that a British expression? <laughs> ladies at lunch? Yeah, that's we the thing, now. right? So, um, so we've been a little bit that. And that's, I'm not denigrating that. That's important. That's, that, that's really important. But one of the things that's happened over the past two years is um, we were anyway, and we would have been forced to if we weren't, um, relook at our purpose, really look at why we're here and what we're trying to do. And our, our sort of mission statement, job description, really said that we promote the art and science of horticulture and then other things, which is a pretty standard thing for societies like ours. But we've really tried to turn that around a little bit. And we're really focused on two things. One is that we are, we are first and foremost a society of members. We're not a botanic garden, we are a society of members. And so we really want to be doing things with and for and our members, um, first and foremost. And we want to expand that membership. And so that means that although we have this beautiful garden, a lot of our focus will be outside the garden. It'll be in Greater Boston, it'll be in schools, it'll be in communities that have issues with food insecurity, that, that have interest in routes to work and pathways to rehabilitation, who are interested in how horticulture can be used in the community. Um, we will continue to develop this. We are continuing to develop this. But uh, we will be outside the garden first. And then the second thing, and the reason why, why that's important, is that we're really reframing um, our purpose to say, we're about helping people first through horticulture. So there are a lot of things, in fact, I would argue that a lot of the biggest challenges in the world today, um, although they are multifaceted and they're complicated, there is an efficient and effective way to address them using plants. So whether it's climate change, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's um, loss of soil, whether it's community cohesion, rehabilitation, routes to work, you know, just community cohesion, um, urban blight, all of those things, there are many ways to address some of these, but there are effective and efficient ways to use plants to do it. And so we're really flipping that. We're saying, okay, we know the horticulture. We're really good at that. But instead of making that our purpose, our purpose is going to be people and how we can impact their lives and change their lives. And our means, our method is the horticulture piece. And we're, we are reframing our programs. Think about that. So we're rethinking our schools programs, we're rethinking our community programs, we're rethinking our garden programs. Um, and over the next three, four, five years, step by step, that'll be what we're doing. So um, I hope you enjoy the garden. It's beautiful. Um, we have to get you back because Chuck wants to give you cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. Um, but I just thought that was important to end on that, that piece. That was Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you.